sanctions imposed by the West on Russia have potential long-term effects on its economy. What does that mean for future Western economic threats aimed at China, which is a far more important economy? Will they deter China from assisting Russia or from following through with Taiwan threats? Joining me today is Gerard de Pippel, senior fellow in the economics program at CSIS, who previously spent 11 years in the U.S. government as an economic analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency and National Intelligence Council. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So, Gerard, I want to start with the Russian sanctions. In the recent commentary, you argue that the sanctions targeting Russia have three goals to deter, to destabilize, and to degrade. Can you elaborate further on the 3D frameworks? Uh, have the Western sanctions been successful according to your framework? Sure. So, I tried to break down the goals of the Western sanctions aimed against Russia more or less in a chronological order. So as you said, that those three goals were to deter, to destabilize, and to degrade. So the first one to deter was, as it sounds, to prevent Russia from attacking or invading Ukraine. That failed, obviously. We can talk about why, but it, that failed. The second goal uh, was to destabilize, mostly to destabilize the Russian financial sector. Um, that was the big tool there was the sanctions against the Russian central bank that effectively froze most of their foreign exchange reserves, basically all the reserves that were not in Chinese renminbi, essentially, or gold, were, were frozen because the G7+, plus the ECB, Japan, UK, Korea, even Switzerland, everyone basically ganged up on the Russian Central Bank and froze their assets, so they couldn't actually intervene in markets. And that meant that for a little while, at least, the Russian ruble collapsed. Now, it has since rebounded. In fact, today, it's it's actually above uh, its exchange rate that it was before the war started. That's misleading, though, because the Russians have put in capital controls. Um, so it's the Russian ruble is no longer a convertible currency. But there has been a fair degree of stabilization in the Russian financial sector. And that is mostly because, uh, even allowed by the sanctions, the Russian government continues to export energy. And, and and other commodities like metals and wheat, but it's most importantly about energy, and that allows them to earn hard currency, which helps stabilize their exchange rate and helps stabilize their financial sector. So, for now, that that has the destabilization goal has not appeared to 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 succeed. The third goal is to degrade the Russian economy. This is slower acting. This relies mostly on export controls, which initially were focused on. Uh, military or dual-use technologies over time that has expanded to include a lot of other industrial inputs and capital goods, so things that factories might need or certain sectors might need, like tractors and sort of some other things um, to keep up production and, and to keep the economy moving. This is slower acting because, in many cases, companies um, or factories will have inventories of those goods. Over time, they'll run out of spare parts, essentially, and that weakens the Russian economy. The goal there, basically, is not only to degrade the Russian economy, but it's really to degrade Russia's ability to continue its war effort. So we've seen anecdotal evidence of Russian factories that produce military tanks having to suspend production. There's also some evidence that, that Russia's running out of some precision munitions because they don't have all the high-tech components to keep making those, those weapons. And so the third, the third goal of degrading is, is working, albeit slowly. You know, Russia's invasion has spurred many talks in Beijing. I wonder if you can help us understand what equivalent sanctions would be for China and how their potential impact compares with the Russian sanctions we've seen so far. If, if truly equivalent sanctions were levied against China, it would be probably catastrophic for the global economy because the Chinese economy is so much bigger than Russia's economy. So. Uh, compared to last year, so before the war started, before all the sanctions on Russia, Russia was a, the 11th largest economy in the world. Russia was the second, sorry, China was the second largest. So uh, China, China's economy is 10 times the size of Russia's. China's banking sector is huge. It's actually the largest in the world, and it's about 30 times as big as the Russian banking sector. Or if you were to look at, say, the amount of foreign investment in Russia or China, that includes foreign direct investment, but also buying things like stocks and bonds, the amount of foreign exposure in China is, is at least six times larger than it was in Russia before the war. On top of that, you have China is by far the world's leading manufacturing power. It's the number one exporter of manufactured goods. It's essentially the world's factory. It doesn't necessarily make all the high value added goods. It makes a lot of intermediate things. It does a lot of assembly, 
but that is a central node in global supply chain. So hypothetically, if, if equivalent sanctions were imposed, such as sanctioning or freezing the assets of the People's Bank of China overseas, so that you know, China's $3.2 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, if, if the West were to uh, kick major Chinese banks off the SWIFT messaging network, um, and some other sanctions that would basically prohibit Western entities from interacting with Chinese banks or certain Chinese entities, if you literally duplicated the sanctions against Russia and put that on China, it would be catastrophic. Um, the For China, uh, so although obviously China is, is much larger economically, it's more powerful economically in many ways compared to Russia, um, but the fact is that China is still mostly reliant on the U.S. dollar for international finance. So only about 15% of China's goods trade, so you know, goods that are on ships and planes, only about 15% of that is paid for in RMB across borders. The vast majority is paid in dollars. So basically, it's very difficult for China to avoid that. And I'm not saying that the West would do the same sanctions, but if they did, it would be massively disruptive. I see. And we see media reports that Beijing is clearly worried about similar sanctions imposed on itself. Beijing has ordered a comprehensive set of stress tests to examine the potential economic implications of similar actions if imposed on China. So what leverage does China have against the West? What are some potential ways for China to retaliate in the future? Well, regarding the stress tests, it's, as, as I was saying, it's actually very difficult, uh, at least in the short to medium term, for China to mitigate its exposure, particularly to the dollar, because it's so reliant on that. So it, I saw press reports saying the same thing. They called in foreign banks and basically said, what can you do to reduce risk? And the foreign bankers said, uh, we don't actually know because there's nothing they can do. So in that sense, China is in the top spot. But because China is so important economically, it does have other tools. If you, uh, if you were to break down the, the, the three core types of sanctions the West is using would be financial sanctions. Those are mostly on banks. Uh, then there are export controls, and then there are restrictions on imports. So basically, the U.S. saying, we're not going to buy Russian oil at the import restriction. If you flip that and said, okay, what, what does China have in that regard? China, in theory, could, could use export controls. It, it, it is, as I said, the number one manufacturer, so it could say, you know, the world, you basically don't get most of your laptops, most of your cell phones. They could also do things like restricting core inputs like rare earth elements, which China is the number one processor of. And that would have a lot of downstream effects where a lot of other goods that might be made elsewhere could not be produced because you need those components. You can only get them from China. Um, China has been working on setting up a, a legal regulatory regime to counter sanctions and also to apply sanctions and export controls over the past two or three years. Mm -hmm. They haven't actually really used it, but the framework exists. So they're, they're trying to formalize some of their mechanisms. Um, but but the, the other big thing that China has is its own domestic market. This is in general, even just apart from sanctions. It's maybe its biggest point of leverage with Western companies and Western governments. So for example, U.S. multinationals that own companies with operations in China, so basically their subsidiaries, the revenues that those companies make in China are bigger than all of U.S. exports to China. So the activity of foreign firms in China is actually often bigger than literal trade. And those foreign firms in China are, of course, exposed to the Chinese market. And in theory, the Chinese government could disrupt their, op their operations. They could organize boycotts. They could tell them they, they have to stop producing um, they could give contracts to you know competitors, et cetera. So China does have a lot of economic leverage. The, the area where China is really lacking would be in the financial domain. Mm -hmm. Yes, China, in theory, could impose financial sanctions on Western banks or on Western entities. But because of the very limited reach of the Chinese currency and their reliance on the dollar internationally, it wouldn't really mean very much. And so those would be mostly domestically oriented financial sanctions. Internationally, China just doesn't have the same the same uh, length that, and reach that the U.S. dollar sanctions could have. Finally, I wanted to turn to China's top one red line issue, the Taiwan issue. Um, tell me, how does the, the strategic environment of Taiwan differ from that of Ukraine? Does your 3D framework still apply in a Taiwan scenario? So strategically, the obvious and very important difference is that Taiwan is an island. Ukraine is not only not an island, but it is connected to essentially NATO countries who are able to resupply it. So Ukraine is, is keeping up the fight, yes, with its own you know, competent military and heroism, but 
you, the Ukrainian military is able to resist and counterattack against Russia because they're getting a steady flow of Western weapons. So that might be like the Javelin missile you probably heard about. A lot of other things are getting tanks now from, from Central European uh, governments. They're getting some spare parts. They're getting plenty of ammunition, et cetera. And so that is allowing them to keep up the fight. Now, hypothetically, in the case of a uh, Chinese attack on Taiwan, it might be very difficult or even impossible to resupply Taiwan because the People's Liberation Army, their Navy, would, would probably at a minimum attempt some type of blockade. So even if they're not trying to literally invade Taiwan, it would make it very difficult to get supplies through to Taiwan, which means that in that scenario, essentially whatever Taiwan has at the start of the conflict in terms of material, weapons, training, etc., that's all they're going to get. And if you try to have a similar analogy uh, with the Ukraine crisis, you know, in Ukraine, as I was saying, they're, they're being resupplied constantly. Taiwan would not be. Now, that would mean that, that the two latter goals of the sanctions, the destabilization and degrading, would be far less viable against China in a practical sense in this scenario. Because uh, basically, you one, China is much bigger, but two, you wouldn't have much hope of um, degrading the Chinese economy at least quick enough to end that war. So you, you basically would have to assume that the Chinese, or sorry, the Taiwan military could hold out for a very long time on its own. That's probably a big assumption. Or you'd have to assume that using those sanctions or the threat of those sanctions after the war began would be sufficient to get the Chinese leadership, Xi Jinping or others, to, to pull back in an operation. I think that is extremely unlikely. I think once once Xi Jinping or, or whoever's in charge of China, whenever, if and when this happens, decides to go, if they roll the dice, they're going to go in. Um, and that means that, that really you're only left with deterrence, which is the first goal um, of the sanctions that were used against, against Russia. And as I said, that was the goal that failed, which means um, it's worth examining why it failed and learning from those lessons. One thing is that uh, before the Russian invasion, the United States and other governments, they did threaten sanctions in the event of an invasion. But what they, what they threatened was actually less than or weaker than they ended up doing in the real world. In other words, they underwarned. Right. They suggested that, that the punishment would be lighter than it ended up being. Why did that happen? Because from, from the perspective of deterrence, it actually makes no sense. Mm -hmm. The logic should be reversed. You want to scare your adversary, prevent them from, from attacking. Um, I think what happened, well, there's a few things. One, apart from the United States and the British government, most Western countries didn't seem to believe that Russia would actually attack because it seemed so insane, but, but they did. Um, the U.S. was warning very clearly about intelligence, but even our, our you know, European allies, and even to some extent Ukraine itself, didn't seem to want to believe that. Two, um, the, it's hard to know how any political class set of voters or you know, any any population in general, will respond to a shock until it happens. And so before the war started, it might have been that the European governments who didn't really believe the war was going to happen anyway, thought, that, well, if it does, you know, it will be fast and the Ukrainians will lose, Russia will win, and that will be the end of it, and it will be hopeless. And in fact, from what we can tell publicly, the U.S. predictions were that the Russians were going to win the war fairly quickly, which was not the case. Um, so... In a world where, say, Ukraine uh, fell quickly, maybe there wouldn't be as big sanctions because it would be seen as hopeless. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, they resisted. And that, that caused uh, an upswell of, of sympathy in Europe and elsewhere for the Ukrainian cause. And I think it probably caught their own leaders in Europe by surprise. And that basically gave them the political impulse to go hard on sanctions. And so, so what I'm trying to say, practically speaking, for future scenarios is... It's very important, even though it's difficult, for the U.S. and its allies to discuss in advance certain contingencies, even things that are very improbable, right. things that they want to think are unthinkable, that they don't want to happen, but to talk about those things frankly and establish red lines early. So internally agree, these are the things we will consider warning indicators, these are the things that we think would be unacceptable. Once those things are agreed upon, or the extent they can be agreed upon, in the real world, if those things start happening, it is incumbent on the U.S. and other governments to be very clear about those threats and saying, if you do X, Y, and Z, we will retaliate this way, this way, and this way. If that actually happens, if those red lines are crossed, then 
the U.S. and its allies would actually have to implement those sanctions. And in my view, is most likely in a China-Taiwan scenario, they would actually have to go pretty hard pretty early, meaning um, doing aggressive sanctions before the actual war starts. Because, as I said, I suspect if a war happens, uh, you know, the Chinese government's going to be fully committed. They're not going to pull back because they would expect at least some sanctions. And so basically it's a call for planning um, and taking seriously these threats. And then finally, um, putting it also into the context of, of Ukraine, recognizing that economic sanctions are really at best a supplement to military action once wars start. And so basically I would not, I, I would caution any policymaker from assuming that economic sanctions are a replacement for credible military deterrence. I think you need both. And if you only have one, the other one might not work. From multiple media reports, we see Saudi Arabia has initiated talks with China about pricing oil shipment in RMB. India has proposed to pay for oil imports from Russia in rupees. And there seems to be this loosening of the dollar's stranglehold on trade and reserve holdings in the globe. Is there any reason to believe the dollar's dominance or role as a transnational political weapon is waning in the aftermath of the war? What does a post-dollar hegemony world look like? And I have to ask this, do you see crypto as a potential tool to invade sanctions in the future? So there's a lot there, we'll, we'll break that down. Sure. Um, the dollar is the world's leading international currency by various metrics. So that would be share of, of official reserves. It would be how much it's used as a transactional currency. It would be how it's used for invoicing. It would be um, how often it is used uh, by other offshore entities to issue debt. So for example, if emerging markets want to issue foreign debt, they typically do it um, in dollars, sometimes in Europe, but mostly in dollars. All those metrics, the dollar is quite dominant, at least at least highly competitive, if not extremely dominant. There has been a um, longstanding discussion, really going back 50, 60 years, actually, of various ways or times when the dollar's dominance might be perceived as slipping. This actually goes back to the 1960s. It goes back to when Nixon went off the gold standard. It also then went uh, occurred in the 1970s during the oil shocks when there was a lot of inflation. Um, you're seeing, you saw it in the 2000s when the U.S. was running massive current, uh, current account deficits. You're seeing it now in the context of the sanctions. Um, in all those cases, the, the uh, predictions of the dollar's demise were at least premature. Um, and it's because ultimately, when you're talking about an alternative, you need an alternative. So if not the dollar, then what? Um, there are different scenarios there. But um, I think the key is to, set, is to accept that in terms of the, the depth of its financial markets, the amount of assets denominated in that currency, its um, predictable legal structure, um, and at least you know, its, its macroeconomic management relative to everyone else, the dollar really doesn't have any, any rivals. The only one that was sort of close was the euro maybe 15 years ago, and then it slipped, slipped back because they had their own debt crisis. Um, there are, you're right that, that um, India and China and others have talked about um, settling energy contracts in their domestic currencies, so rupees or RMB. It is, it is an important distinction, though, between the pricing of a commodity and the settlement of a commodity in a given currency. So oil is priced in dollars. Now, if, if you are selling the oil, we can agree to settle it in whatever currency we want, but the pricing, the global pricing is still based in dollars, and there's no sign of that changing. Now, at the margins, if, say, China is, is paying uh, Saudi Arabia um, in, for its oil in RMB, we're talking you know, tens of billions of dollars uh, per year, maybe over a few years. That would be an RMB that would otherwise be um, in, in dollars. But the key issue is ultimately, for the RMB in particular, is, and, and the rupee is just way, way, way below that, is it's not Chinese, the Chinese currency is not fully convertible. China has capital controls. You might hear economists say that a lot. The real issue there is that there, there is not a lot of RMB assets outside of China, whether they be deposits, whether they be RMB denominated bonds. And if you are, say, Saudi Arabia and you're accepting payment uh, in RMB, you can really only use the RMB to buy stuff from China. Now, China has a lot to sell, so that's not a terrible proposition. But if you don't want to buy something from Europe, from Japan, or whatever, you have to convert it probably back into dollars to, to, to make the transaction work. And so any erosion there is going to be gradual. Um, and I think from the perspective of governments like, say, the Saudis or others who are considering 
getting away from the dollar system, part of that is geopolitical, right? If they're worried about the threat of sanctions, the U.S. does and, and, and can use sanctions. Uh, most recently, in a multilateral sense, it would be very difficult to escape from. Um, but, but there are only so many governments that are actually worried about those kinds of sanctions. And even then, they still have to rely mostly on dollars. So Saudi Real, for example, their currency is, is pegged to the dollar. There's really no technical way as it stands now, that, that can be pegged the RMB just because there isn't enough outside of, of China to make that work. In terms of reserves, the dollar has been slightly eroding. It's about 59% of global reserves. The RMB is maybe 3%. Uh, this is IMF statistics. The big holders of reserves are actually oil exporters in the Asian economy. So China actually cannot hold RMB assets as reserves. So it actually kind of um, it, it naturally limits how much can, can shift. But in general, you've seen sort of ups and downs over the last 50 years in the dollar share. But the fact is that the dollar is overwhelmingly dominant. And that's because during crises or in general, most investors want the whole dollar asset. In fact, you're seeing it right now, this, this month, this week. There's all these bad things happening in the global economy, high inflation, even in the United States, high energy prices, a lot of uncertainty. There's a war and what's happening to the U.S. dollar. The dollar is getting stronger. And it's because a lot of money is flowing in and actually money is flowing out of China. And it's because the dollar is ultimately the safe haven asset. And I don't see any plausible scenario in the medium term, at least, for that changing. You asked about uh, crypto. <laughs> crypto is a whole other thing. Um, but we'll just talk about it in the context of sanctions evasion. Um, there was, when the war started, there actually was a lot of talk about could Russia use cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin to evade sanctions. The short answer is it's technically possible in, at small scale. But at a large scale, it's very difficult. And it's difficult because for three key reasons. One, cryptocurrencies are actually not, they're not anonymous. People call them anonymous, but they're not. Um, in English, the word is pseudonymous, meaning that they're, they're linked to a particular wallet or an entity. But you may not know the name of the person who owns that, but they are linked to that. And there are forensic ways, there are companies that actually specialize in tracing which entity is getting payments. So it's, it's actually hard um, to evade capture on the blockchain because everything on the blockchain is recorded. The second thing is the way the market is structured is mostly through centralized exchanges. Those centralized exchanges and, and basically all major jurisdictions except for Russia and a few others, and cryptocurrencies are illegal in China at this point, um, they have what are called know your customer rules. So they are required by law to know who is holding those accounts to comply with anti-money anti -money laundering rules. And so it's actually very difficult uh, to use those mechanisms and get away with, with, with evasion. There are things called decentralized exchanges or also you can do direct transfers. Um, those are much, much smaller in terms of transaction though. And the third issue is liquidity, which is that basically uh, the cryptocurrency market trades in these say tens of millions of dollars per day typically. It might actually be lower now because values are falling so much. Um, Russia, for example, before the war started, was was importing something like nine hundred million dollars worth of goods per day. Okay, so it just there was not nearly enough transactions out there in uh, in cryptocurrency to, to make that work. If we're talking China, it's it's going to be in the billions per day, right? And so there just there's no way there are enough cryptocurrency um, assets and trading out there to, to make that work. 